share my experience with getting started in building a digital humanities project uh, of a very different nature than what uh, Dr. Tribbiano talked about this morning. Uh, like Dr. Tribbiano, I was very fortunate to receive a grant last summer from this Center for the Digital Humanities uh, to support the beginnings of this project. And for that, I thank AJ. Uh, looks like he just walked out for a moment. Um, and I also thank our very own Dean. Uh, where is, there he is in the back, uh, Dean Rob Friedman of the uh, College of Humanities and Social Sciences. In fact, I really thank Rob because he's been supporting this project uh, for a number of years. So um, it would not be where it is today if it wasn't for his help. Um, and I also want to thank my partner and collaborator, Dr. Elizabeth Keith, who's here visiting today from uh, Baruch College uh, in New York City. Um, and together, she and I are creating a database that will transform 18th century census data and historical maps from the French Caribbean into digital data that can be used for geographic information system or GIS mapping projects. And I also want to give a shout out to my student assistant, Kyla Izquierdo, who's been extremely helpful in getting me started in using the mapping software ArcGIS. And she's doing all sorts of useful behind the scenes work. Uh, this database is uh, intended to become a research and teaching tool uh, that will enable scholars and students to visually analyze commodity production and population shifts in the French Caribbean across space and time in ways previously unavailable to historians and inaccessible to most undergraduates. Dr. Heath and I came to this collaboration out of our mutual interest in the history of food and commodities. As Dr. Heath mentioned earlier, she's tracing how a variety of commodities, ranging from sugar to cotton to indigo, shaped the growth of French capitalism. And as AJ said before, I'm working on the history of coffee in France and the French Empire. So let's get started and analyze and interpret it to make sense of how and why things happen and to explain change over time. The most frequently used historical evidence is textual, whether something produced by hand, like a manuscript, or something printed, like a book. Another common type of historical evidence is image-based, such as a work of art. So here, for example, we've got two classic pieces of historical evidence, both produced during the 18th century. On the left, you can see we've got a census. This is from the French colony of Saint-Domingue, which is modern Haiti. It was made in the year 1752. And there's something strange going on in some of our text. Why is that? Hmm, that must be the camera. It looks fine on my screen. I apologize. Uh, I'll explain pretty much everything we have. So the captions are sort of uh, uh, gravy, let's just say that. Um, OK, so this census has all sorts of numeric information about the colony. Uh, such as the human population, categorized by location, gender, race, age, freedom status. It lists the number and type of farm animals that were present, and it also spells out the agricultural capacity in numbers of sugar estates, indigo producers, and amounts of other agricultural commodities, ranging from bananas to coffee to cotton. On the right, behind it here, we see a map of the um, same colony, produced just a few years later in 1760. It also contains information about Saint-Domingue, although of a different sort. This time, pretty obviously, the emphasis is more overtly geographic. We can see the colony relative to the Spanish side of the island over here, Puerto Rico far to the east, uh, Cuba to the west, to the northwest, and just the little tip right there of Jamaica, also to the west. So here we have a text, and we have an image. In this case, they happen to go together particularly well. And historians are always very, very excited when they have things that go together like this. And historians like to correlate A to B text to map uh, through written description, through analysis. But what if we could read the information present in these two types of documents in combination? by visually representing the data of the census aligned with the space of the map? And what if it were also possible to observe changes over time to this data by seeing the shifting composition of the human population or the growth and spread of different commodities? These questions were the light bulb, if you will, that sparked our present project, which we're calling Mapping Commodities in the Early Modern French Caribbean. Now let's zoom in on the map itself. 
Old maps are windows onto the past. When you look at a map like this one from 260 years ago, your first inclination, as we spoke about a little earlier, is probably to take it literally. You might start off by saying, okay, what part of the world does it show? Your second inclination might be to wonder about the map's accuracy relative to modern maps, which is also something we discussed uh, during the community of practice. <laughs> Nearly always, when looking at maps produced in the 18th century and earlier, there will be inaccuracies, and they can range from mildly wrong to wildly wrong. So I have overlaid this map from 1760 with the, modern, with the outlines of modern Haiti in red here. So you can see the coastline is clearly wrong, the boundaries are inexact, the towns are probably not located in the right places, etc., etc. These are all real faults of antique maps. But I don't recommend looking at historical maps for that kind of information. Old maps have many interesting things to tell us beyond geographical accuracy. In the distant past, maps, most maps made by Europeans were official products of the state. And because maps were tools of governance, map makers were usually interested in representing governmental concerns. So, for example, there's a text here at the bottom of the map, and it tells us things. For one, it tells us that the island has a horrible climate. <laughs> Quote, the heat is oppressive and the air is unhealthy. Unquote. But, the map maker tells us, the island is economically useful. Quote, all the animals and plants brought here from Europe have thrived and multiplied. Okay, so that's some interesting information. Other maps show different information. For example, this is another map of Saint-Domingue uh, from 1777, and it shows what I'm calling the geography of administration. Uh, what we have in the explanation over here and laid out with boundaries within the map, we can see jurisdictions and parishes delineated. Here's a map. Moment. There we go. I've got a very heavy, uh, image-heavy PowerPoint, so it's a little slow to load sometimes. Here we can see the entire... Uh, region of the Gulf of Mexico from uh, 1780, and this map shows the international competition for colonies. So if we zoom in on the legend, there's a color coding. The yellow indicates Spanish possessions, the red is English possessions, etc., etc. The French, the Dutch, and even the Danish had their islands. Here we have a map of Martinique. Uh, and this one shows conceptions of religion and of wealth, including man-made and natural resources. So again, there's a color coding going on here. This time the island is depicted, uh, divided into three religious zones controlled by three different orders of Catholic priests. One is served by the Jesuits, one by the Dominicans, one by the Capuchins. And if we look at the legend for this map, it will tell us that the map also details the locations of dwellings, of sugar refineries, water mills, roads, even anchorages. Here is a map of St. Kitts. This one shows the local economy with land ownership or estate boundaries. All those little thin lines represent different estates. But what I think is Additionally interesting beyond that is there is an unintentional uh, set of information here. We can see the effects of war and colonial competition. By 1779, when this map was made, St. Kitts was a British colony, and it had been since 1713, so that's most of a century. But apparently the French still dreamed of repossessing it. Although this is a French map, and it's labeled the Ile Saint-Christophe, it's actually a copy of a British map of St. Kitts, and those plantation lines are the work of a British surveyor. So I don't know what the French are hoping to get out of this knowledge, but invasion is probably on their mind. Some maps even show a state of ignorance. So here we have a map of the northern part of South America, and if we zoom in on the center, this bit here, uh, the map maker wants us to know that this country is unknown to Europeans. And furthermore, he's critical of previous map makers because he points out that near here, someone placed an imaginary lake and on its banks, the imaginary city of El Dorado. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, so that's one kind of data, and this is half of our data set, as it were. This is the visual, the map component. And then we also have the census component. Census data provides a different window onto 18th century official views of the world and of empire. Anyone could draw a map. There are maps, there's, the ones I showed you were all official maps, but there's also plenty of maps that you find in uh, books. Uh, people sketched maps all the time. Uh, pretty much anyone with uh, ink and paper could produce a map if they wanted to. But not just anyone could take a census. Even more so than maps, census data was collected in the colonies by and for the French government to inform administrators, governors, and kings about the state of the empire. Censuses were snapshots of a colony's value for a given year. So we might ask what mattered to 18th century officials? And I will invite you now to see what a few sample censuses can reveal. So we're going to take this census right now, and we're going to zoom in over in this section here and look at the uh, human population. The colonial governors kept close track of everyone under their purview. And if we study this and we look at the language here, we immediately see that two significant human categorization uh, categorizations in these colonies were race and freedom status. Whites were always presumed to be free in these colonies. Non-whites might be free or they might be enslaved. And I want you to note that I have put free and white in brackets and in yellow because uh, I want to highlight the fact that the census taker did not think it was necessary to spell that out to him. It, those were obvious points. Uh, but when it came to the other categories, he did note free versus enslaved. And I want to pause here to say a few words about 18th century racial terminology in these censuses. In this one from 1730, we see three terms in use if we look at the French. And it's curious, the French is a lot more legible than my English. Um, so the terms used are blanc for white, mulatta, and negra. And for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to translate the term negra as black. Although we should remember that the term negra carried many racial connotations and associations that probably made it closer to the English term negro and some other more unsavory words. Mulatta is also complicated. And I'm translating it here, I prefer to translate it here as mixed race rather than mulatto. In the racial hierarchy that emerged in the French Caribbean in the 18th century, mulatta could mean specifically the child of a black parent and a white parent, which would be someone who's 50-50 racially, or more simply, someone with parentage of both African and European descent. So mixed race seems the better translation to English uh, right now. The important thing to note when thinking about this, these terms is that this is a period and a place when racial identity was more fluid and graduated. The so-called one-drop rule that came to prevail in the United States was not yet at work. However, let's look at a census. So this one's from 1730. Let's jump ahead to a different census from the year 1785. And as the detail I've extracted of the human population from 1785 shows, terminology has shifted. Notice that now the census taker has specified a category called whites. A second category has also emerged that is new for all non-white people who are not enslaved. They are now being called the gens de couleur libre or free people of color. Their freedom distinguishes themselves, distinguishes them from the unfree slaves who are presumed to be black. So that's our third category here. These are clearly terms and categories that we'll have to think carefully about as we move forward with this project. Eventually, we hope to include on our website critical essays to help users of the data to think about these categories and their significance for understanding and using this data. Now let's just go back for a moment to the first census from 1730 and return to the question of what governors wanted to know about the people in their charge. Um, these censuses give us a pretty good sampling of other official concerns beyond race and freedom. All the censuses counted able-bodied adults. Most also noted who could use a musket, so that's up at the top, men carrying arms. Um, and uh, they all note the presence of children 
And uh, many of them also note the presence of the elderly. <coughs> if we go ahead to 1785, we also see that some censuses counted, uh, also counted specific roles in the colony. Uh, they are all uh, whites in this case. Uh, so this, uh, try and read it for you, bailiffs, treasurers, refiners, surgeons, clerks, laborers, and servants are all specified here. Okay, so that tells us something about official concerns about the population. Moving on from the human population, we can see that another subject of great importance to the home government, and therefore to census takers, was evidence of each colony's profitability. Most censuses took stock of crop production, usually by tallying the number of living plants. So this one counts plants of coffee, cacao, cotton, annatto, which is a kind of dye, and bananas. Some censuses, like this one, counted the number of plantations. So this one literally lists sugar, coffee, and other in terms of plantations. Um, various types of mills are listed and uh, acres of certain produce, such as uh, sugar cane, potatoes, and yams, are specified. Other censuses additionally tally productive uh, facilities that a colony might possess. So uh, we've already seen the ones in white, so I'm highlighting the ones in blue here. Indigo processors, rum distilleries, brick makers, and pottery and lime kilns are spelled out here. When we look at 18th century colonial censuses like these, we have to think about the economic systems that they economic system, excuse me, that they represented and supported, which was mercantilism and the triangle trade. Mercantilism, if you haven't heard of it before, which is an unusual term for most uh, people today, uh, refers to a pre-modern form of state-protected economy. It was the main economic system practiced by France, indeed by all European empires, in the 17th and 18th centuries and it was a precursor to capitalism. Mercantilists believed that a country's wealth depended upon protecting the nation's production against foreign imports while maximizing exports. Essentially, their goal is to maintain a favorable balance of trade with other countries. Colonies were central to this economic theory. They provided the raw materials which the mother country could turn into finished goods and were themselves a captive market which purchased those finished goods in turn. Under mercantilist principles, the state controlled ownership of land in the colonies and protected them militarily. Moreover, the state controlled all shipping to and from its colonies. So in practice, this meant that only French ships could transport goods and peoples to its Caribbean islands, and only French ships could transport commodities from those islands. All products had to ship on French vessels, and they could only be sold to the mother country or to other colonies within the empire. The so-called triangle trade, which we can see uh, here in the center, uh, developed in the 17th century and matured in the 18th as a result of mercantilism. And we can see how it's got its name from, from this slide, which shows the triangular flow of goods and peoples from France to Africa to the French Caribbean and back to France. This system enmeshed production and consumption. Items produced in one place were purchased or consumed in another in a seemingly closed loop. So raw or semi-refined sugar, uh, green coffee, and raw cotton produced in the Caribbean was sent to France for refinement, roasting, and spinning. Finished products then, such as rum produced from sugar and textiles produced from cotton, were sent to Africa where they were used to purchase enslaved people the enslaved Africans were then transported to the Caribbean where they were sold along with more of those finished goods to the colonists who were incidentally mostly forbidden from producing, from developing their own industries. Now, of course, reality was a lot more complex than this map suggests. Finished products were also uh, returning to the colonies. Raw materials brought to French ports would be frequently re-exported to other places for refinement. Um, so Holland and Britain, for example, would buy raw sugar and turn it into white sugar. Now, in the censuses which we've collected, we can see, there we go, the production and output of raw materials in tremendous detail across the entire French Caribbean, as this map shows, and over a full century, along with the rising presence of enslaved peoples from Africa who were doing nearly all the labor. Historians have been working for many decades now to figure out how productive these colonies were. 
by analyzing data on a particularly visible commodity such as sugar, or by counting the millions of Africans transported across the Atlantic and determining where they were sent. Most histories of the 18th century French Caribbean focus on case studies of an individual island, usually Saint-Domingue here, or Guadeloupe here, or Martinique. Those were the three richest uh, colonies, uh, French colonies, I should say, so this focus is understandable, but it's far from the whole story. We have 264 censuses taken from 12 colonies over a 100 plus year period. So with these, we can establish a much deeper understanding of the scope of the French Caribbean colonial economy. No one's ever put this all together before. These censuses exist in purely paper form. Very few of them have ever been transcribed or published, and none of them have been digitized. So our idea is that by compiling them into a publicly accessible database, not only will we be able to analyze them for our own respective projects, but others will be able to ask their own questions of the same data. All right, so that's the background to our source material. Now I want to return us to that light bulb aha moment uh, the idea of combining these kinds of historical data, censuses, and maps into a usable database. To accomplish this, we need to move from discussing evidence to discussing process and tools, and specifically GIS, or Geographic Information System Software. So um, I had a passage here where I was going to define GIS for you, but I think we've established at this point that we know what it is. <laughs> You've been hearing about it all day. Um, so, um, let's see, what do I want to, I can skip that part. All right, here's what I'm going to say. So, I'm at the very beginnings of this project, so I can only show you some exploratory efforts of what we've managed to do so far. But once our database is sufficiently rich, and we've progressed in our ability to use the software, it will become possible to ask questions of the evidence that are not currently possible without excruciating time commitment to number crunching and graph creation. And uh, I think we've also established today that GIS can be a powerful tool for students in the classroom to access evidence that was previously inaccessible to them by reason of language or skill barriers. Okay, so let's look now at some of the practical issues involved in creating a GIS database. Um, so I think this is also something that's been mentioned, but I'll mention it again. For anyone here who is thinking about beginning a project of your own, take it from me that starting a digital humanities project like this from scratch is a tremendous amount of work, more so than I had anticipated, and I thought I had a decent idea of what I was getting myself into. There's the work of learning the digital tools, learning ArcGIS software. Uh, there is also the work of transforming the sources into machine-readable files. That, in turn, requires figuring out what you might want the software to be able to do with the data. So you cannot complete the digitization process until you have some understanding of the requirements of the software. So what you kind of have here is a strange mix of, on the one hand, you're learning a head-spinningly complex new type of software, while you're also doing some really tedious data entry, but the data entry still requires a fair bit of imagination. And all of that, of course, comes on top of the scholar's normal business of collecting the data in the first place, which in the case of this project, I did about three years ago at France's National Archive of Colonial Records. Okay, the first stage of this project, which is where we're at, involves two steps. One, digitizing the 18th century census records, and two, learning ArcGIS. I start with each uh, record, I start with the photographs, like this one here, of the original manuscript censuses. So this is one that I shot from 1752. This, as you can see, is essentially an 18th century spreadsheet. That's great, because it means it translates fairly directly into an Excel or Google spreadsheet, and looks like this. Kind of crazy. This, which doesn't look so massive, turns out to be quite enormous when you translate it uh, onto a type format. So I transcribed most of the censuses for Saint-Domingue last summer as part of my grant, and Dr. Heath, uh, who has a similar grant, is starting to transcribe the Martinique censuses now. It might look like a simple matter of typing up data, but there are always complications. So sometimes uh, what, the sense, what the scribe wrote is illegible, sometimes because they were sloppy, 
more often because of the ravages of time. These papers are 200 to 300 years old, and they are crumbling. Especially, they were folded multiple times, and so and every time paper is folded and unfold, it gets more fragile, and eventually they break, usually along the fold lines. Sometimes I type wrong numbers in. So scribal illegibility, you just have to deal with it. You struggle, you kind of make your best the job that you can. Numeric errors, sometimes they're the scribes, sometimes they're mine. Happily, they can usually be caught and corrected with some math. And here, I love uh, Google and Excel's um, sum function, because uh, all of these columns have sum totals at the bottom, so I can run a sum function in Excel and then check my number against the scribes number, and if they are the same, then I know we're both doing the right job. So that's always a happy moment. Once a census has been fully transcribed, uh, we can, uh, we then have to make the file GIS readable, and this involves various uh, small corrections that I won't get into right now. Next, we upload the prepared data into ArcGIS so we can start to perform spatial analysis. Where GIS excels for a project like ours is in visualizing connections between several different sorts of information. So this screen of me at work shows population and commodity production in 1771 Saint-Domingue. Now, if we look at just a piece of that data, I can, for example, choose to compare just the human population. So here we see the relative distribution of three categories of people. Uh, the uh, white population, the darkest color is where the uh, highest number of whites are, ditto with slaves, ditto with people of color. And what is interesting, I think, particularly about this breakdown, is to see how the white and enslaved populations correlate quite closely. So where there are the most whites in the north, there are also the most slaves. And that makes sense, because the most profitable plantations, which were mainly sugar estates, um, sorry, I jumped ahead, the most whites uh, we would probably associate with the areas with the highest concentration of wealth on the island is also where we see the most slaves because uh, the most profitable plantations, which are mainly sugar estates, which is, were, uh, I think, entirely white-owned, in Saint-Domingue at least, had the greatest number of slaves. So the most sugar estates are in the north, the most whites are there, and the most slaves are there in the same place together. Now, conversely, free people of color were frequently less wealthy, and bear in mind, they too owned slaves, but they tended to own many fewer. So that is borne out here, where uh, the uh, more, less wealthy areas um, have fewer, um, have more people of color relative to uh, blacks and slaves. I should say, free people of color. Now, let's add a commodity to this map. And I'm a, I'm a coffee person, so I've picked coffee to look at here. In 1771, coffee was starting to experience a production boom on the island. Not surprisingly, a majority of the new coffee plantations cluster where the most people are already established, in the north. But because the startup costs of beginning a coffee plantation were much lower than for sugar, and coffee production required far less slave labor than sugar, we also see some interesting overlaps between where people of color are in the majority and uh, a fairly decent concentration of coffee in the south and in the mountainous interior. You might ask, why does this matter? It matters because historians have been contending for some decades now that coffee contributed to a socioeconomic and racial revolution in Saint-Domingue. Maps like this support that argument, which is important because it was in many cases these same free people of color who, 20 years later, in the 1790s, would become leaders in the Haitian Revolution. We can also look at changes to one commodity over time. 1739, so we're going back in time here, 1739 marks the first year that enough coffee was produced on Saint-Denis to warrant being counted in the annual census. And this map shows that the earliest adopters clustered in areas of what we know from the previous map were low to moderate wealth, particularly in the South. Now, if we compare 1739 to 1771, we can see movement as well as growth in coffee production. 
The majority of early adopters were in the south and the interior, as the big circles show. Uh, areas that we now know are of lower prosperity. But by 1771, we see two things. First of all, the area of coffee's concentration, concentration has shifted to the north, where the greatest collection of little dots are. Um, but we also see coffee is now being grown generally across the entire colony. So with time change visualizations like this, and this is admittedly very crude, it's just a first step here, um, but it shows the, cap the capacity the, and capabilities of GIS uh, for letting us start to think about how this data correlates with other historical developments in Saint-Domingue, as well as across the French Caribbean, such as changes and growth within the populations of free people of color, enslaved people, and whites, changes in legal codes as whites sought to control the increasingly powerful Jean de Couleur, changing economic opportunities as the fortunes of different commodities rose and fell, and expanding frontiers within individual colonies as coffee let colonists develop estates at higher elevations and on more marginal land than sugar or cotton had. Looking ahead, the next stage to building this database will involve correlating historical maps to modern maps. There are three issues uh, that we have to address. Uh, the first of these is the question of cartographic projection. So this is that map I showed you before uh, from 1770. And here we start to see the issues. 18th century cartographers had different standards from modern map makers. And among those, one of the most significant that we have to wrestle with is they had different ways of projecting a three-dimensional world onto the flat surface of a two-dimensional map. Correlating the historical with the modern involves a process that I'm illustrating here called georeferencing. Lining up the past and the present, uh, and that's what's going on here with all these little numbers and blue points. These are points of commonality between the underlying modern map and the historical map that's sitting on top. When you do this, the result is a slightly skewed map. But we do it because it can allow for some valuable discoveries, such as changes in the location or size of settlements, or even identifying the location of specific plantations. So that's the first issue. The second and third issues deal with boundary and administrative changes. So just sticking for the moment with this map of Saint-Domingue, it specifically shows the interior border, this line right here, which the map tells us here was traced in 1770. So that was the border separating the French half of the island from the Spanish half of the island. Now, I have overlaid, we're back to the original 18th century projection, I have overlaid it with this blue uh, modern uh, map of the exterior boundaries of Haiti. And so clearly what we can see, so here is the 1770 line, and here is the modern boundary. Clearly, modern Haiti has a lot more territory to the east than 18th century Saint-Domingue had. Now here's another issue. So that's boundary changes. We also have administrative issues. Okay, on this one, the thick blue line marks the 18th century exterior boundaries. And then the colorful bits are the modern departments of Haiti. Um, so you can see how modern Haiti has departments that are far outside of the bounds of 18th century Saint-Domingue. So we have to address change over time with each island's administrative units. Not only are they different spatially, but they're also, the jurisdictions are simply not the same as the modern ones. So we're going to have to design digitized representations of the internal as well as the external borders. Because the modern district boundaries that we've been using so far that I'm showing you on those sample maps are actually not entirely applicable to 18th century data. So that's what we're at so far. And what I want to do next is just talk about some uh, unexpected problems that we have encountered. So as I said earlier, this is not nearly as straightforward a project as I had originally thought. When I first found the censuses, I was super excited. I was like dancing around the archives going, I've got numbers! Because um, the thing is, I'm a cultural historian, and I'm used to analyzing past people's lives and mentalities from literature, from art, from other such sources. So when I originally saw sheets and sheets of numbers, I got really excited. 
because this was hard, cold data, and I could grasp it, and I could number crunch it, and I would have facts to share with the world that could not be argued with. Um, that's so I thought very naively. But once I started to actually transcribe these censuses, I realized that the census data is anything but clear. For example, I thought that we'd be able to easily compare commodities such as the production of sugar to the production of coffee, but you can't. What I've learned is that there's all sorts of complications involved here. So here's uh, just three for you. Uh, this illustrates the problem of numbers. Depending upon the commodity, Censuses recorded numbers with very different meanings, even within the same census. Some things are counted by the estate or uh, production, such as number of refineries. Um, and uh, other things are counted by the numbers of plants. And then other things are counted by the method of storage or the method of growth. Uh, so we've got pits of manioc, acres of potatoes. Um, you, coffee is counted in the hundreds of thousands and even millions of plants. Whereas sugar is counted often in terms of estates or refineries. So you might have one sugar refinery that's making white sugar in a given region. In the same region, you have 105,000 cotton plants. And let's see, uh, you know, 372,000 coffee plants. Um, so you can't compare one to 300,000. It doesn't work. Uh, and yet we know that the sugar estates are massive and uh, the most profitable thing on the island. So that is uh, highly uh, frustrating to me. Okay, that's one issue. The second issue, which I'm not going to illustrate, I'll just talk about, is locations. The census takers recorded their intake by principal town, but most of these named locations included multiple villages or communities. And then on top of that, the actual location of the agricultural estates was always outside the towns. And uh, if it was sugar, it might be not that far from the towns. But if it was coffee um, or indigo, uh, those plantations might be located several days' walk away from the nearest community. So we're going to have to make allowances when we represent the data and its lo the location of data on maps. All right, and then the third issue, we've seen this, but I now want to stress the problem here. The third issue is erratic data collection. So as I mentioned before, we've got 264 censuses from 12 different islands covering nearly a century of colonial production, which is fabulous. It's going to be a great database. However, when you drill down to the level of the individual colony, for any given island, the number of censuses that have survived, as well as their contents, can vary wildly. So uh, this is due to a number of reason, reasons. Uh, wars, for example, like the Seven Years' War, or the Haitian Revolution, or the American Revolutionary War, these things routinely disrupted the business of empire, and that, of course, includes census taking. Related to these wars, many Caribbean islands changed hands multiple times as different European powers vied to control them. And then we just sad the vagaries of time. As I mentioned before, these pieces of paper are really old. And not only are they crumbling, but there are also ones that were once existed that no longer exist that have simply not been preserved. And then another issue that I had not initially foreseen is that ArcGIS itself is a major challenge to learn. So I didn't know how steep of a learning curve would be involved in learning not just, I thought, new software, no problem, but it's actually a new category of software that I've, I, I have to, I'm having to develop an entirely different mindset just to be able to use the software. Okay, so some final words of conclusion, and hopefully we can get out of here before we get too snowed in. Um, I want to ask, what can we do as historians with GIS that is different from traditional analysis of text records? What do we gain from the visual as an analytical tool for studying the past? Thinking about these questions <coughs> involves theoretical and also disciplinary issues. Historians tend to focus on the text. I think we're pretty clear about that at this point. When faced with numbers, Historians will usually produce tables or charts, like these, to uh, interpret the data. It's quite unusual to take the next step of turning text and numbers into visual data, like this. While charts and graphs are excellent tools for historical analysis, it's time 
pastime even, I would say, for historians to add GIS to the interpretive toolbox. With GIS, we are able to combine subjects usually considered separately such as seeing the attributes of a human population relative to the production of multiple competing commodities. Visualizing data in this new way, in turn, opens doors to new possible questions that historians can ask of the data. GIS can also give a sense of place and add texture to our understanding of the past. What was going on at a given place, at a given time? Who was there? What were they doing? How did these factors change over time? It's really hard to ask these kinds of questions when looking purely at texts. I also want to ask, uh, or you might be asking, what can this project offer to people? Well, I'll tell you. Uh, we have two audiences in mind. First, it's our hope that the database will become a useful educational tool. For example, I plan to create a course here on the 18th century digital Caribbean. My goal is, or my idea, is to teach students to formulate questions which they can apply to the census data and then learn to manipulate the data to visualize results. They could, for example, contextualize colonial production growth and decline relative to international conflicts and competition, such as all those wars of the 18th century. I also see our database having value when used in conjunction with other digital humanities projects. Students could map changes in French colonial and slave and free populations over time and connect that to data in the transatlantic slave trade database which contains the searchable records of nearly 36,000 slaving voyages. Data showing where Africans came from and where they were brought, which islands, which ports, in which years, can now be correlated with our newly digitized census data about both human populations and crop production across the French Caribbean, but also within uh, different regions within specific colonies. Another terrific <coughs> site is a colony in crisis which is, happens to be supported by our own A.J. Kelton and the Center for the Digital Humanities. This site, Colony in Crisis, is about a famine that struck Saint Domingue in 1789, and it's loaded with rich documents that have been translated to English and also to Creole. Students could use the translated documents to analyze colonial leaders' claims of famine production and then compare that to the hard census data in our database. Our other target audience is scholars. We predict that our project to make this trove of census data accessible holds potential appeal for scholars of contemporary issues as well as being useful for historians of the more distant past. For example, as, uh, uh, oh, Dr. Heath, as Dr. Heath said earlier, um, modern Haiti faces widespread environmental degradation in the form of deforestation and soil erosion problems. Problems like this can actually be traced back to the 1750s when people began to push the frontiers of settlement and agriculture in Saint-Domingue to higher elevations and interior spaces not previously settled. And they did so for two reasons. As coffee production expanded, these marginal lands were the only areas still unclaimed and uncleared and therefore available for poorer farmers to purchase. Also, the higher elevations and sandy soils turn out to be ideal soil and climatic conditions for growing coffee, unlike the better watered coastal plains. But unfortunately, clearing these highlands created serious problems. Even in the 1780s, observers were already discussing erosion and mudslides. Our data can also provide an additional basis for understanding the long-term long impact of colonialism and slavery on the Caribbean. We foresee that it might be of interest to ecologists, <coughs> excuse me, sociologists, and anthropologists, in addition to historians. This data could provide fresh insight into the historical roots of contemporary issues. Coffee and sugar and rum, rum of course being a product of sugar, were central to the 18th century French Caribbean economy, and as my uh, final slide here shows, they are still formidable luxury products from that region today. Thank you.